Welcome to another episode of iCatch Killers. I'm strangely excited but also nervous about today's guest. To say he's an interesting character is an understatement. He's brutally honest and raw and dances to the beat of his own drum. He owns the life he has lived and makes no excuses for what he's done. Listeners may find some of the things discussed here quite confronting. If you want to understand crime, you need to understand the people involved. I reckon we're lucky to sit down with today's guest as he gives us an insight into a world few get to see, few survive and even fewer are prepared to talk about. Today's guest lived a life of crime. He was violent and uncompromising, but one day he looked in the mirror during another endless stint in prison and he didn't like what he saw. So he decided to turn his life around. He's now known by one name, Spanion, and is described as an Australian counterculture icon and viral hip-hop star. This is going to be an interesting chat. Spanion, welcome to I Catch Killers. How are you? Thank you. Good, good. Now, I've got to say, when I said uh, I'm getting you on a guest as, uh, on I Catch Killers, it evoked plenty of reactions from people. You're, uh, you're, you're, you're out there. You're yeah, well known. I'm trying my best to cause many emotions. <laughs> They're all as uh, profitable to, uh, to me as any other. Yeah, yeah. but uh, I, I was I was surprised. Like I had seen you. I'd, I'd yep. uh, actually my son's friend was watching one of your YouTube clips, and uh, he's going check this guy out. And that's yep. the uh, that's the first time uh, I uh, got to uh, know about you. Yep, yep. So it's uh, your life uh, has really turned around. Yeah, it has. A hundred percent. I'm legit like a civilian nowadays. I've been out of jail for five years, and like it is. It's. That, the, the mannerisms and, and, the, and the way I talk and that stay with you forever, it's that entrenched in me that I live my whole life like that. So I can see, people can see me as like the way I talk and walk and that is still, you know, a criminal and this yeah. and that. But like, I don't even know that life anymore. And I have a, a proper fear of jail now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, it finally scared me. Yeah. It took um, 13 years, but yeah, like now I'm scared of jail, yeah, so... Well, I, I, reading, reading your book, you uh, you made a comment that yeah, you, you're stuffed up in your 20s and uh, you weren't going to stuff up in your in your 30s. You, yeah. Wake, wake up, wake there is, up there yourself. There is definitely a point of no return, and I think for different people, that point is at different stages in their life. Like, for, for some people, the point of no return might be in their 20s if they don't have the mind to overcome it. Um, I'm lucky that... You know, like I started thinking differently in my 30s and here we are. Look at yeah. me now, I'm yeah. nation, nation famous. But um, a lot of people, even the 30s is too late, you know, like yeah. unfortunately, as um, bad as that is to say. But I, I knew that there's going to be a point like how much of your life can you actually just go and disappear for many years and come out and then go and disappear for many years and come out until the point that you're not actually even going to know anyone. It's almost like that for me yeah. now. But you take it too far and it's like, all right, first the life you had disappears. You can sort of get that back. Then the friends disappear. You probably can't get that back. Then family start disappearing. Then what are you? Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I thought, like, I'm not going to get into my 40s. Yeah. Like, as harsh as it sounds, I, I feel like people may say this about me in my, in, as being someone that done it in their 30s, but I feel like if, if you're going in and out of jail and you're getting out in your four, your 42... Yeah, you're not going to turn it you're, around. You're not, what are you going to do? Yeah. What are you going to do? Yeah. Like, you're not, you know what I mean? I, yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean. And I, yeah, in my life as a, a cop and uh, speaking to people I've, I've dealt with that have been in and out of jail, mm. it gets to that point where they've got to make a decision. Yeah. And uh, sometimes they say I get too old for it. I'm yeah. too old for the life. For it's sure. a stressful life yeah, being yeah. a criminal, I would suggest. So it's, uh, yep. um, I, I see a lot of people uh, put a lot of effort into a life of crime. And I yeah. think, Jesus, if they turned that into uh, something uh, you know, something yep. that wasn't about crime, mm. they'd be very successful. But normally with the podcast, I, I, I talk about the uh, yeah, you're growing up, which we will, mm. and uh, yeah, how you became who you've become. Because you are so brutally honest, and uh, I listen to stuff that you put out on uh, YouTube and, and whatnot, and you're very open and frank yep. talking about your your life of crime. I want people to understand where you are now, like yeah, you know, uh, uh, Australian counterculture icon and yeah. viral hip hop star. Yeah, what, what's the magnitude of? Uh, what's the magnitude of, of that? Yeah. Like how does it? It is like. I can't walk down the street without getting yelled at, like in a positive way. Mm. I like it's 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 crazy. It's like every single person knows me. Like my combined following on social media is about half a million. <laughs> There's 20 million people in Australia. Like it's like one in 40 people actually follow me. Yeah, you know what I mean. And the other 39 hate me, but they still know who I am. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't. I don't know. Like 
I think a lot of um, this counterculture icon, what happened is, uh, is from uh, when I started speaking out on, on YouTube after I was putting out music for a while, I started telling uh, my stories of how we lived. I was documenting yeah. my stories in no other way, right? So like I would, I put out videos back when we were junkies, me and the boys, this is how we would break into houses. And if we didn't think this is how we'd car search, this is how the boys would snatch a bag, this is how we do this. I put videos out like that, right? Yeah. And in no way was I apologetic. I wasn't groveling when I was playing. I wasn't, I wasn't yeah. saying like, oh, look, I'm so sorry, but this is how we used to break in the house. No, I wasn't. Yeah. I was telling my truth. I paid 13 years of my life for, for stealing things off people and you know hurting a couple of people. I'd done more than enough. And I don't feel um, like I need to apologize to anyone. And Australia really doesn't like that. They yeah. really don't like that. They want it. They... I found out that you they want to wa show contrition and oh yeah. mate, they want me to be crying and begging them for forgiveness. Yeah. So because I came out and I was just like telling the facts as it is, in in like with a smile on my face, yeah, you know, and and I still do. I talk about my crimes. I laugh about them. Yeah, I've never done any putrid acts that I'm ashamed of. So I can laugh about my crimes. You know, sorry if I stole your laptop in your car. Well, I'm sorry. You know what I mean? Yeah. But let's get on with life. You know. Well, so because I I I came out like that. Everyone took it as like, I think the way they took it is I'm like trying to influence people to do that. Yeah. And to say that is to say like anybody who makes music about anything is trying to get people to do it or whoever wrote the Ocean's Eleven script is trying to influence kids to rob banks. It's like, no. like that, That's a good analogy. Yeah. Uh, so because, no. And I, I think that's what's misunderstood. And I, I think some of the people that would go against you going, what, you're glorifying crime or you're yeah. encouraging people. But we, we'll, we'll get into that in yep. the podcast now because mm -hmm. I know when I spoke to you yesterday and we, we you know, talked about uh, different things that we'd cover mm -hmm. and it's definitely not what you're about but yeah. I think like watching when uh, you know, when I first uh, set eyes on what you were saying I'm listening going what the fuck is going on here mm -hmm. and then I started to listen and there was a ring of truth about what you were saying it, yeah. was, it wasn't filtered have you always been that way um, yeah I guess so I guess so yeah I guess it just comes from I just do not care really what uh, people I just don't care. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. I guess that's where it comes from. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think it gives people and and certainly on this podcast, I always said that uh, we'll take you into a, a, the world of crime, yep. a deep dive in in the crime, and mm -hmm. uh, certainly coming from someone like yourself, you've lived it and uh, yeah, day to day, and uh, you got the scars from it, and you, mm -hmm. you paid the price from it. So it's going to be an interesting chat. Yep. But I can't help sitting here and thinking that uh, ten years ago. If you were doing what you were doing and I was doing what I was doing, you'd be, probably be looking at me as a mongrel cop and I'd be looking at you as a dangerous, reckless criminal. Would I'd that be, be paranoid. <laughs> yeah. I'd be paranoid. Yeah. 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 I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be so, like, judgmental, maybe that not to that extent, yeah. but I'd definitely be paranoid. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, funny, it's funny when you sit down with people and you actually start to understand people, look at things from different perspectives, yep. that you find that you do have some things in common. Yep, and yep. Uh, that's certainly reading your book and the way that you explain uh, explain your upbringing and some of the things you've done. I mightn't agree with it all, but I go, yeah, I can understand where you're coming from. So yeah. let's um, let's talk about your childhood. Um, where'd, you, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Dulwich or Marigville area. Yeah, my family mm. were, um, they grew up there too. Um, yeah, they, they were, I, was, I wouldn't say I was from a criminal family to the extent that I'm some notorious family, like, you yeah, know, yeah, no, yeah. not that extent, yeah. but my family definitely were uh, street people that battled to survive, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that sort of housing commission and, yeah, uh, yeah. so yeah. battlers. That's it. And uh, you, you moved around a little bit, but it was always in the city? Yeah, so the first 10 years of my life, it was always bouncing around the Maryville Dulwich area. Yeah. Um, my mum was struggling to to pay private rent there. You know, we were a poor family. Yeah. Um, and she was on the housing commission waiting list for a long time. Yeah. And um, I think the, the first place, uh, when housing commission actually got back to her the first time, they offered her a place in Dobell Flats in Waterloo. Yeah. So it's about as ghetto as you can think of. Yeah. It's, 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 it's sort of like a jail when you walk in there. And uh, she didn't want to borrow that. Yeah. She'd rather be poor and live in private in Maryville. Yeah. And then um, there was City West, which is, I think it's like a government subsidised, you know, like public housing thing, yeah. sort of like Housing Commission, just to keep it basic. And they offered her a nicer place in uh, Ultimo, so just a couple of streets away in the Glebe area. And um, 
that was like the best day of our life. Yeah. It was yeah. all the weight off her back and we finally had money to like go on a holiday or do something like that. And um, yeah, we, we ended up living how, there. How old were you th around that time? I, I moved there, I think I was about 12. I think it was the end of primary school. Did, yeah. you, did you have a sense of being poor? Was, was that part of your, your childhood? Did you I, look at people and think, what the hell's going on there? I, well, at the time, the only thing that I thought was that, I just really noticed in the Maryville, Dalichu area, it's all like what you'd call wogs. So Greeks, Croatians, yep. Italians and stuff like that. And just their home was just completely different to mine. Yeah. Like walking in their house, it was like walking in a museum. Like my house is sort of like this like kid friendly, some messy yeah. uh, PlayStation game scattered on the floor, broken door, stuff like that. Yeah. Their house, it's like statues. It's like if you sneeze wrong, you're breaking something. It's just, and everyone was like that. It was just, I knew that like my life was different. Yeah. But there was no concept of money as a kid. So I didn't ever think it's because we were poor. Yeah. Yeah. In hindsight, um, maybe, maybe not even. To say that money had anything to do with that is probably just a cultural thing. Yeah. Yeah. And when did you when did you start to uh, and when you're at that age, it's not mm. even about doing criminal acts, but yep. it's getting yourself in the uh, getting yourself in the trouble. When did yeah. you start getting yourself in the trouble? Um, I started proper getting myself into trouble around the age of maybe ten, eleven. Um, I was always burning things. Um, one of those kids that was obsessed with fire. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, that's always a da dangerous thing. I, I was yep. listening to one of your podcasts and you're making smoke bombs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, so. uh, burning things down, um, making smoke bombs and making explosives and um, playing with knives was everything to me. Jeez, the age of you'd 10, be a 11. psychiatrist, uh, <laughs> 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 like, tick, tick, tick. So, yep, yep. Yeah. Um, I think the Probably the first time I got in trouble was um, police-wise. Yeah. Well, not in trouble, but I speaking to was the first time I stabbed somebody at primary school in the yard. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess so. My age of 11, I think. I think it's year five. Now, like, when, when you when you say that, and that's mm. what I, I think people find interesting. Yep. Like, you, you're so honest. Like, people would have an excuse, yeah, I got into trouble, and then yep. I'd have to extract it out of you. And I, I'd just go, yeah, when did you get into trouble? And you said, oh, I stabbed someone at, at school. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, what's that about? Why, why, that come about, that was, um, I, was, I was trying to impress some girls. Yeah. They'll always get you into yeah, trouble. Yeah, yeah, I was trying yeah. to impress girls. So I uh, took a knife to school and decided to stab someone uh, in front of a couple girls, thinking that, like, it would impress them. I remember the look on them. <laughs> they were just looking at the floor. So I like, I had this lad. Like, he was sort of a mate too. That's what's sort of the bad thing. It was like there was no argument. Um, and we went down. Two girls, me and him, went down and sat down the, the corner of, of the the schoolyard. You know. Yeah. And um, I took my shirt off. You know. <laughs> then I pulled the knife out and I started swearing at him. And he's like, "What are you swearing about?" Like, it was, it's. It's pretty sad. The only reason I don't feel bad about it is because I was a 10-year-old, 11-year-old kid. Do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. If you say like an adult does this, it's completely putrid. Yeah. I would think that if an adult, me now as an adult, if I lured another adult into a corner and turned on him for no reason, that's a putrid act. Yeah. Especially someone scared. Yeah. You know? But I was 10, 11 years old. Yeah. You know, that's why I just, I laugh about that stuff. You know, anyway, stabbed him and... Um, that would have got you in a lot of trouble at school, I would imagine. Yeah, so the police got called. Um, I remember getting talked to by police, not getting charged. I think I don't know why. Too, too young, perhaps. Too young, maybe. Yeah. Um, and then like my mum being angry, and yeah. he wasn't allowed to play with me anymore. <laughs> but that is like a kid type punishment for yeah, something yeah. stupid, isn't it? Yeah, it is. What um, you, you you got into trouble, obviously, and uh, did you have role models that you looked up to? The older kids? Did you have some some of the the guys that were getting in trouble looking up to them what, so what back then my role it? models were my family so yeah. my who i call my oh, it's my mum's younger brother so yeah. it's my uncle he was like my older brother small age gap we shared bunk beds together yeah. he was a kid when i was a kid yeah uh six seven years older than me um was a very upfront visual heroin addict thief in front of me i yeah. grew up with that in the room with that um i'd be nine ten years old riding around in stolen cars um, he, going with him while he would meet some Vietnamese bloke in a park and get on and then come home and I just knew he'd be mixing things up and smoking things and needling them in his arm and 
this while we play PlayStation. It's very, it's, it was fully exposed to me. Um, yeah. yeah, like waiting for all different. He'd go out thieving all night, uh, waiting for all goods to come back. So this was my childhood. Um, that was the only man in my life other than my father, who I didn't really know left me when I was born uh, to go to move to Queensland, started yeah. a new family. Um, the only stories like that I would ever hear was that how my dad was this great getaway driver. Um, so he was like a really good driver to the extent right. he could have been a professional driver. Um, he was a go-kart champion and stuff like that, which might seem funny, but that's how all professional drivers start yeah. out, big go-kart yeah. champions, you know? And um, and that's all I'd hear, like the age of five, six, seven, um, they'd have no, they wouldn't hold back to tell me how my dad could steal a Cortina and fish you from gutter to gutter and cops would never catch him and... So that was so my. That, 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 yeah. That's what's fed into your psyche well, as a, yeah. a kid. That go, he's respected because he could drive a getaway car. Getaway car, and that, and my older brother will live that way, and they're the only men I knew. See, I I find it really interesting. I hope people listening to it get an understanding because in, in the cops, especially in homicide, that I did. I saw the tail end of uh, the crime. So yeah, by the time I stepped in, the life that you've lived is coming to, coming to the end because yep. you, you've done the big big uh, crime of yep. uh, murder but what people don't understand put and what i hope people can put themselves put yourself and you don't use it as, as an excuse um for the, the reason you turned out but no. i defy anyone if they're your role models how how, how are you gonna turn yeah out? yeah I, I yeah i do never use it as an excuse um at all I, I, in fact there's a lot of the times people put it on me and try to excuse me like so that's so that's why you were like that i'm like no, I don't think so. I was like that because I wanted to be like that. But yeah, I guess yeah, you're still own, you're they still verbal own me. Choice. Yeah, they verbal me into like believing that. So then I just agree with them. It's like, oh yeah, all right, maybe that's why I'm like that. <laughs> but I definitely um, do do not say like I don't need an excuse. Yeah, I was a criminal because I wanted to be. Yeah, and I loved it. I don't need an excuse. Yeah, but okay. but like um, subconsciously, the more I think about it, maybe that's why I wanted to be a criminal, and that's what it feeds into. Yeah. Okay. And so the drugs were in your face, the, the heroin through yep. your uh, your uncle slash old, older brother. Mm -hmm. um, when did you think that was the life you wanted to live, life of crime? So Did you make a conscious decision saying, this is what I'm going to do? Yeah, I did. I did. Um, I, I would say that it's at the age where any child becomes any character that they want to build themselves. So... You know, when you get to that age, maybe for a boy, it's maybe a 12-year-old where you stop wearing the clothes that mum bought you and you pick where you fit in society. You're like the skater kid or you're like the graffiti yeah, yeah, kid or yeah. you're, you know, and, and everybody and every kid does make that decision. It's where they choose their own style and they try to become like adults, you know? Yeah. And um, that's what I chose. Yeah. Which may, may be um, leading exactly off what you just asked yeah. me before. And that was my choice. It was like I was a... I was, I wouldn't have even said criminal kid, but I was a kid that was like burning things and knew well about drugs, um, didn't know what they do and stabbing things and this and that. But I didn't say I was a criminal. Yeah. Um, and then so when, by the time I'm 12, it's like, what am I going to be? I'm going to do all that stuff. I'm going to be a criminal. I'm going to yeah. go hard. Like I'm going to be better than anyone in my family. I'm going to be, yeah. see, watch me. So it was, a, <laughs> and did you look at crime as a way of making an earn? What was not the, at all. So what what was the what was the attraction to the crime? The thrill, or um, that's a hard question. You know, um, I've never actually been asked that before in that way. Was it was it money? Um, I guess something in me thought being bad. Well, it's not. I guess I know that something in me thought that being bad was cool. Yeah. Being bad was cool. Yeah. Um, in the same way, like if you're being naughty at school, you're the cool kid, you know, or if you're a bully, people think you're cool Yeah. in that sort of mind state. Um, yeah, but it was just, there was no halfway for me. It's like, I'm going to be cool. Let's see it. What do we do? Yeah. yeah. When was the first uh, time you got into trouble to the point where you end up in a boy's home? Oh, uh, the Because you did Cobham, uh, yep. didn't you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so the first time was in 2001. Sorry, I always get my ages wrong. I may have been 14 or 15, depending on the month. Um, 2001, and so I was already stealing and stuff by then. Yeah. It had been a couple of years. And um, some I stole a phone at school. 
I was going to Dover Heights High School then, yep. even though we're living in Glebe, but I got kicked out of Glebe and there's not many public schools in the city area. Yep. Yep. So it's like you either go to Glebe, Cleveland Street or Dover Heights. Right. Because people spin out. They're like, how do you live in Glebe? But you go to like Dover Heights, <laughs> which is some like school full of Jewish rich kids. And, you yeah. know, it's just crazy. But um, that was is like... Is that because of the public schools and you've been kicked out of other public schools? Yeah, and yeah. That was the only one that, that was like you. considered as a local school to us city kids, yeah. as weird as it is, even though it's eight suburbs away. Yeah. Um, so I ended up there anyway and stealing people's phones and doing whatever I was, I was doing during um, lunchtime. Someone had given me up um, to the principal, got me suspended. So I took that as a opportunity to flex my violent side, which I yep. seen as fun. So I went back to school the next day with a kitchen knife. Yep. Only with the intention of causing a scene and whoever gave me up, I was just going to put the knife to their throat in front of everyone, in front of the school. That would just, cause a scene. Yeah, yeah. But like, it ended up being a lot bigger scene. So yep. I'd, this is the smaller scene that I planned. I put a knife to someone, whoever, I don't know how I, was gonna, how I thought I was going to find out who, but I just thought if I produce a knife, they'll admit it. I'll put a knife to their throat, no harm done. Everyone will know not to give me up anymore. That was the whole intention. And um, it turned into some siege that made national news. Yeah. I, <laughs> Well, I said the first time I knew about you was the uh, watching you on YouTube, but I remember that siege. Oh yeah, really. <laughs> and uh, that was. Uh, did you comprehend what was going on when? Because it, it was escalating. Then I, I know, and you're smiling. I'm, I'm smiling, and I got to put it on record. We can't yep. condone that. Like course, uh, yeah, in the, in this type of day and age, too, in, in light of yeah, uh, what goes on in uh, mm. on in schools and and that type of thing would uh, yeah, that's an active violent offender god knows how, yeah, how yeah. it would play out now. yeah but we'll talk about it without judging you because yeah, you're yeah, be, yeah. being honest yeah so you've got a siege situation happening at the school yep okay you've gone to one classroom yep i would imagine kids run out or whatever yep ah uh, sorry so i went to and um i went to the first classroom which was my class and uh pulled the knife out teachers telling me to get out i produced the knife who the fuck t- How's swearing on this podcast? You're allowed. You're allowed. Oh, who the fuck gave me up? Blah, blah, blah. I'll kill you. Fuck you. This and the same shit. You know, talking rubbish. And they're like, no, we don't know what you're talking about. So I went to the next room. Yeah. Right. I thought like, I'll go a few rooms. I'll find him. I went three or four rooms, done the same thing. I'm kicking the door off the wood for um, dramatic effect. Um, you know, instead of opening the doors, I'm fly kicking the doors I, now. I, I, I'm with you. Yeah. I, I, I'm understanding what you're saying. And yep. I, I'm just sitting here going, really? Yeah, but anyway, yeah. So, dramatic yeah. effect. This is what I do like about your honesty. Yeah, I fly yep. kicking doors open. And um, anyway, so I went through about four doors. And I don't comprehend the scale of what I'm doing. Like, see how just before you worded it in a way like it's an active violent offender. And this yeah, and, yeah. And like, I know that that's how civilians view it. Yeah. But coming from where I come from and coming and from the life I had, it, it's just like funny stuff. Yeah. Like the people I know, even the adults from the areas I grew up in, they'll be like, relax, stop being an idiot. Stop being an idiot. Yeah, yeah and but see how down. you were yeah. like the average civilian. It's like an yeah. active violent offender. It's horrible. Everyone like... Yeah, run, run. Run. It's a, yeah. I've got no concept of that. So... I'm at the fourth classroom and I hear warnings on the radio system by the principal. And um, the fourth classroom, I end up putting a knife to someone's neck. Uh, he jokingly said that, yeah, it was me because I knew him and he was a f- sort of a friend. There was a kid that I had a rapport with. and So um, he, he was someone that you knew, knew and probably yep. didn't react like you're saying other people <laughs> reacted because he probably thought, oh, this is just this idiot being funny. an idiot. That's right. Yeah. And so, but because I'm... I put myself out there that much that if you're making a joke like that and now I do nothing, I just look like an idiot. Yeah. You can't go door to door asking who done it. Someone says who done it and then you just go, oh, well, you're stupid and then walk away. So I had to grab him, put the knife to his neck. There was a fight between me and teachers. I was doing the whole like, get away, I'll cut his throat type of thing, you know, yeah. that you see in the movies. And um, I heard like like a evacuation on the on the radio. Um, and then in the hall, kids were just pouring out of every classroom. And I've only been to four classrooms, so 600 kids in the school, 90% of them don't know what's going on. Yeah. So they're running through the halls just laughing, like, it's evacuations, fire, it's yeah. a bomb. You got out of the other uh, class. Yeah, you know, yeah. and so I joined them, you know what I mean? I started running with them, first with the intention of just, I'm just going to hide my knife and run with them and pretend nothing happened. Yeah. You know what I mean? But then, like, so that's all I was, I was going to leave it there. Then we all got down to the the assembly area where all the kids were lining up, and um, I ran down, no knife. I was going to leave it there. 
the principal called me out on his megaphone in front of everyone. He yeah. seen me coming out. He turned to me with the megaphone and he said, Anthony's my real yeah, name. Yeah. He said, Anthony, stop there. Put the knife down. Stop this. Just go. And five, 600 kids looked at me and it's like, and I'm getting looked down, put on the spot. Again, it's the same concept. Like you got to go on your feet. You can't do all of that and then just stop. You're just an idiot, you know? Yeah. So I pulled my knife back out in the funniest scene and um, just waved at it. Everyone said, I don't know why. I'll kill you all. And when I said that, <laughs> I don't I, know look, why. you're gonna get a reaction. <laughs> yeah, when I said that, 600 kids had had split. Yep. They started running. They started pouring in the streets. This and that. Anyway, I won't go like on with it, but I ended up chasing a few kids through the streets. Some some teacher had gone and got some um, grown men from a construction site who were looking for this murderer. You know, yeah, this this yeah. murdering kid. So they think they're looking for a school rampager. Yeah. You know, really, I was just having fun. So they ran up to me with shovels, bashed me yeah. with shovels. Grown men, there's nothing I can do. Yeah, like, I had yeah. a knife, but like 14 yeah. years old. Yeah. It's, yeah. So absolutely smashed me, um, held me down. And um, I just remember the news rocking up before the police did. There was news, vehicles, like they were flying. They were handbraking. I just heard, arr, arr, and like Channel 7 with like this thing on the roof. And I'm looking, I'm thinking the news, like far out. Did, you did not comprehend what was going on? No. Nah. The magnitude of, of... It was just, it was just like, I was just trying to be, uh, I don't know. I didn't comprehend it. Yeah, You're trying to be short. a bit of a dickhead. But yeah, a I was dickhead trying to be a dickhead. A, a, fun, a funny way. Yeah, but sort of. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, what, it wasn't the best of plans. <laughs> no, no. You're always going to get uh, get caught. Yeah, but, uh, of course. There's no there's no getting away with that. Um, so, then, okay, you're taken away. I would imagine you, you're taken yep. to the police station. Yep. What happened then? Uh, same thing, like, as they ring my mum, my mum comes up, pretends she's upset, has a cry in front of the police, so she looks like a, a good mum. <laughs> not that she's not a good mum, but looks like she's like a really against crime mum. Um, you know what I mean? Like bung it on I for the what, coppers, you know, know what you whatever You're giving does. your mum up, but anyway, I don't <laughs> see. <laughs> and she always used to do it. Like every time, like, like I'd be doing crimes and she'd just be like, ah, stop, stop parking the stolen cars there. Like get it away from the house. Yeah. That, yeah. But then like, if I get caught for a stolen car, Jeez. she'd rock up like some How Catholic dare nun you do that? crying, you know, like what's going on? What happened to you? I'm like, I had this car yesterday. You just told me to move it. Like, I wouldn't say that, but anyway, um. She come up, starts crying. They sent me to Cobham, the first time in juvie. Cobham out at St. Mary's. Um, really put an emphasis on my mental health. So because it was the first time I got arrested ever. Yeah. So I wasn't down as just some raging criminal. It was just, and it, because the type of crime it was, they were more feeding into like, there's something severely wrong with his mental I health. I would and, imagine you'd be run through the ringer by psychiatrists and psychologists yeah, and for sure. all sorts yeah. of experts. Yep. So they gave me some, um, after 28 days in, you got to understand, it's my yep. first time, 28 days in, they gave me some um, intensive programs unit that I had to attend to go deep into what's wrong with me. Yeah. yeah. And did that, from your point of view, did that serve any purpose or? Uh, I don't know if it just was my attitude or I don't I, I had done that type of stuff like most of my life and it and never leads anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, it never leads anywhere. Yeah. So it didn't unravel anything or no one, reveal any nothing. magic. No. Nah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So okay, you you've done that. Did you ever go back to school again? Did that any school let you in after that? Um, no, no school I was after that first time in boys' homes. Mm -hmm. Um so whatever, I was maybe late 14, early 15 years old, up until, so the, over the next three and a half year period until I was an adult, yeah. I had be, I spent maybe six months of that out. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I pretty much lived in boys' homes okay. since that first time, yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. What, what about the different areas, like inner city? We, mm -hmm. we think of inner city as one area, but there, were, there was different feels to the inner city, where it, whether it be Redfern or Woolloomooloo yep. or Glebe or yep. whatever. Talk us through the different... Uh, from your point of view, the type of life that you're living and the different feel that each area had. All right. Uh, like, as a whole, we see ourselves as one. Um, it is... It, there is a lot of suburbs in the inner city, but they're all very small suburbs. So I say, to make people from the western suburbs understand, it's um, all, like, 15 inner city suburbs would probably fit in one of your suburbs out west. You know yeah. what I mean? You go a street and it's a different suburb. Yeah. Having said that, um, there is a slight different feel 
there is um, an emphasis in different in different um, suburbs like Woolloomooloo. The feel of Woolloomooloo was really about making money in a thieving, a sly, non non confrontational way. What we'd call searching. Right. Um, so you, you, you're a thief in the shadows, distracting shopkeepers and popping the teal and and you know non confrontational crimes was like a real emphasis in Woolloomooloo. Uh, Glebe was a big thing back in the days. All the boys were robbing banks and doing ram raids. Yep. Um, Redfern was just Mad Max in real life. Yeah. Um, it's just anything you can think of. I'm like, it's just absolutely anything. That's That was a whole different level. Um, and Waterloo was like the highest concentration of all of it. Waterloo, the amount of housing that's in Waterloo is mental. Yeah. So it's like Waterloo had all of it. Um, Having said that, though, we're all the same people, but yeah, they, they, that were the slight differences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you have an affinity with one particular area, or um, were you just where you were at that stage of life? So yeah, the, the areas like living in Glebe, I more hung around Waterloo just because of my attraction to the just the larger scale of it. Waterloo is the yeah. larger scale of it, and um, and I love that. And but I did end up. Uh, identifying myself as a wool boy out of all of it. You yeah. know what I mean? If you ask me, if you're if you're a nobody, you ask me where you're from, I say I'm a city boy. I'm from the inner city. If you're a city boy, if you know what's going on, I'll say specifically I'm a wool boy. Maybe that's because I feel like out of everywhere that I hung around, the older boys of Woolloomooloo took the most time into helping, like, teaching us stuff. So um, actually schooling you on the on the on how to make a dollar that's through it. the crime? Yeah, the yeah. older boys would teach us how to jiggle elevators, how to distract shopkeepers. They, you know, and um, not that it didn't happen everywhere, but like I, I had the best rapport with the older Willow boys and they taught me to become the criminal that I was, yeah. I feel. Yeah. Um, so like, yeah. Were boys' homes, that type of, uh, when you're incarcerated in boys' homes, was that a deterrent to you or was that just going in and it was almost like a reunion with your, your friends? What was the... To me, it wasn't a deterrent at all. It yeah. was um, some of the best times I had as a juvenile were in boys' homes. Yeah. Um, boys' homes were... I, it can easily be a deterrent to some people. I'm yeah. not saying that boys' homes were doing things incorrectly and it made kids feel like it's a party. Yeah, it's you're just, just talking I, individually, yourself. Indivi yeah, that's right. Individually as myself, it was like... It was like a, a, a school camp. It was like yeah. everyone's just... You're training, you're playing sport... Um, you know what I mean? You're playing PlayStation, you're eating good food, and you kick them back. There's parts of it you don't like. Um, yeah. You know what I mean? But yeah, it was definitely not torturous. Okay, so it wasn't wasn't a deterrent to you. And not to me th at all. Then, no. then when you came, it, did you just see that as a, a price you pay if you're going to do the crime? You you you're going to do time in the in the boys' homes. It, it, I actually seen it very soon off as a, just a part of my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, yeah. I didn't even see it as it's in terms of it was a price to pay. It was like a part of my life. And at the start, it was normal. Like, it was, I don't know why, but it was like, that's where I should be going. Yeah. Um, and then it got to the point that, like, That's interesting. So you are, like felt, well, this is what I deserve. This is where I should be, or th this is... I think in when you decide you want to be a criminal yeah. and um, you want to do it to your, your fullest, yeah. you're not doing it to your fullest until you're sitting in a small yard with the baddest, toughest kids from all over Sydney. Yeah. You're not. Yeah. I don't care how good you are at stealing cars you, and how much money you You've made the rep team, That's basically. right. Yeah. made the rep team. Yeah. Like, if you're not going to juvie, you're nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And who was the crew you were hanging around with? Did you have a tight uh, crew of friends? or In juvenile? Uh, oh, just outside? out on the street, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I did, I did. I had a, a, a tight um, group of friends. Um, our crew was called YWB. And we were called Younguns with Bundles. Yep. Uh, so initially, it started as Young Woolo Boys, YWB. Yep. And um, we were searchers, heroin addicts, yep. um, mostly doing cat burglaries. So while people were asleep, sneaking around, um, it, we would resort, if we didn't make money the night before, we would resort to stealing your laptop out of a car. Um, all these crimes seem... Um, even in hindsight, seem uh, very petty. Yeah. But the amount of money, like I tell people, like you got to think, you know, in two thousand and four, a Pentium four laptop I could easily sell for a thousand, twelve hundred, thirteen hundred dollars. Yeah. To say that you could walk twenty minutes through the inner city back then and not get three out of cars, complete non-confrontational, so 
if you're, if you're going to weigh up risk to reward ratios in crimes, yeah. it has to rank as one of the highest. Like, you could literally spend two years going around breaking in, in the shadows, breaking in someone's back window, stealing their laptop and yeah. making three or four grand a night. You could do that for years without getting caught. It's and actually yeah. hard to get caught doing something like that. Yeah. And yeah. if you did get caught, you got charged for steal from motor vehicle. Yeah. It's like not, uh, the most significant. Most charges. people would get bail from the cop shop for yeah. something like that. Yeah. Like, so if you think of it like that, you could go around making back then this, this laptops and that you can't even sell them anymore. The security's yeah. too good. Three, four grand a night. You're talking like times that by seven. It all goes on heroin, by the way. That's yeah. why we didn't own cars. Yeah. But you're talking 15, whatever, 18 grand a week. And like maybe one day you'll get charged with still for motor vehicle. So, Cops will buy you a McChicken meal in the cop shop yeah. and you'll be on the streets five hours yeah. later. So so is that, uh, you've set out each day, that was, okay, how are we going to make our make our earn like that? Oh, uh, definitely. The, the, the and route, you, you had, a, you had a, uh, a a buy for your stolen goods? Oh, yeah. You had, had all that yeah, Every suburb in the city it. has some Vietnamese yeah. family that'll buy anything off yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. So it was all, all accepted. You grab grab the computer and uh, get it here and we'll give you the cash. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And when did you start with the drugs? When did the drugs get hold of you? Um, so I started as almost immediately when I decided to be a criminal, smoking pot, drinking alcohol. Yeah. Normal normal um, teenage stuff from the hood. Um, heroin, heroin, 16 years old. In my area, it was like the... No See how I said if you're not going to... Weird to say this... Mm. If you're not going to boys' homes, you're nobody. Yeah. If you're not on the heroin, what we call uzzling back in the day, it yeah. was smoking spots. Yeah. Um, if you weren't doing that, you weren't one of the boys. It was like how maybe in other suburbs, like you got to, you, you know, you if you're not smoking cigarettes, if you're not going behind the school and smoking bungers, you're not the cool kid. Yeah. Where I'm from, took you can imagine. And, and took it up another level. Yeah. You can imagine being hanging around which red fern down the yeah. block and. I don't. It's not a shock to anyone to learn that if the teenagers back then, if you weren't smoking heroin, you're not one yeah. of the boys. Yeah, yeah. So you'd smoke it, not inject it. Was it? Um, at it the, was start, it yeah. the ne next step was injecting. We used to pride ourselves on smoking it. Yeah. Um, we call ourselves uzzlers, and um, we always thought that we wouldn't inject. Uh, yeah, we just thought, yeah, we're uzzlers. We make mad money. We smoke spots. You know what I mean? And um, we all ended up injecting it. Back in those times, I remember when heroin first kicked in when I was growing up, and I lost you know, people. I saw people uh, lose their lives from it. Did you guys realise the, the the path you're on once you started uh, using the heroin? Not at all. So all the older boys we idolised were all heroin addicts, yeah, and we idolised them. So yeah. how could we see any different? It, it would take our mind state to change to see the older boys as some type of um, sad humans, some yeah. sad um, life humans for us to see that path. But we didn't. We you glamorized did, the older did, boys. You so did, didn't see it? No. Nah, so, like, yeah. Okay. So, uh, escalation of crime. Where you, you're stealing cars. Um, you're breaking into cars. Yeah. Um, assaults. Were you doing assaults? Yeah, yeah. They, they, I was doing assaults. Um, throughout all of this, yeah. uh, so someone might ask, uh, like probably people have thought already in, yeah. listening to this podcast, well, if breaking into cars was such a low-risk crime that you couldn't get locked up for, why did you spend six months of your life, uh, your juvenile yeah. life out? Yeah. Uh, those two things, they go hand in hand. The whole time I carried on stabbing people. Yeah. Like that wasn't the only thing I'd done. That was just my money thing. That was how I'd pocket a grand or two a day. But I would always have a box cutter and meat cleaver on me and, and just like looking for an excuse to stab someone. But that's, you know, and I, I see in your, your book you, you talk about mainly the people that you were targeting as victims were street people. So, yeah, yep, they're, yep. They're, they're in the in the game, so to, yep. so to speak. But that violence, like stabbing people mm. and uh, stabbing people and not reflecting on where where's that come from? Have you been able to work that out? Because you look back at it now, I dare say you yeah. go, ah, that, that's not on. But at yeah, the it's, time. Um, all jokes aside, there's definitely something wrong with me. Right. Like, I'm not going to say yeah, in no, any I, other I, I, There's definitely yeah, something not. wrong with me. Um, even now, like, don't get me wrong. Stabbing members of the public for money, mm. that's ridiculous. Yeah. All right? I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Have I held a knife to members of the public for money? Yes, I have. Yeah. All right? It, 
the only people that I've stabbed have been other players in the game. Yeah. You know what I mean? People who are participate, people who will stab other people. Like, don't worry about these people. Like, this is the life you live. It's like feeling sorry for a soldier that got shot while he's shooting someone else. Like, yeah, that, yeah that's They're the way in it the is. Game. Um, that's right. Um, What'd you ask me? <laughs> I, 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 I'm just like when you you rattle out the stab. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. People. The, so so and, and you've you've acknowledged. Okay, well, there's something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, sorry. I know what you said. So thinking back, even now, even in my mind state now, mm. right? Would I not stab somebody uh, because of some type of ethical, uh, emotional reason? Saying players in the game again. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not because of that. I just hate jail. Yeah. I just hate jail. There's plenty of people, uh, there's plenty of times I wish I didn't hate jail and there's plenty of people that I'd like to stab a lot of times. Like, uh, well, seriously. I did warn people that you're going to be brutally honest. Yeah. But yeah, okay. Like well, that, that's, that's um, there's, I got no, like, I have no reason to, to lie about that. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like when I think back at those people that I stabbed, do I feel really bad or anything? Yeah. I honestly don't. Well, I, I think, and I, I appreciate your honesty here because we want to take people into the, yep. the mindset of what goes on in the world of crime and, yeah, what you're saying doesn't, overly shocked me because right. I've seen seen that world. Yeah, but sure. I, I'd say other people would be going, whoa. Yeah. But that is the world of world of crime that we talk about. Yeah. And uh, so it escalates. You've gone to boys' homes. When mm. did when did you uh, you hit the big house? Uh, as soon as I turned 18. I think it was my 18th, the day after my 18th birthday or on my 18th birthday, transferred from juvenile. Police come pick me up at turn 18. You can stay in juvenile as an 18, 19 year old if you're serving a juvenile yeah. sentence, but you have to be of impeccable behavior. So um, clearly I was gone on my birthday. <laughs> so they rang up, it's his birthday, come and get him, you know? I can't, I can't <laughs> imagine you being annoying anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they took me from Cobham to Penrith police cells, uh, which are underneath the courthouse. Yeah. Um, and I was entered as a adult inmate on that day. Got my min number put the green clothes on, completely different. Yeah. In just like, just in every negative way. Yeah. Yeah. You, you realise then it wasn't uh, it wasn't the fun game of the, the boys' homes or institutions? No, no, I didn't realise right, right then. I yeah. didn't realise right then. Um, yeah, so I just seen it. My initial thought was just how dirty and smelly yeah. everything and everybody was. <laughs> yeah. As funny okay. as it is, well, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. in boys' homes, like everything's clean. Yeah, the still... boys are cool. Like we dress nice, we gel our hair. Everyone smells nice. Right. In jail, it's like because in boys' homes, right? You're not so much because in boys' homes, I think the way that I can explain it is the the courts are a lot more forgiving. So when you're dealing with people, homeless people, people of mental illness, or people of really hard upbringings, the judges aren't just locking them up. Yeah. Right. So. The people who are locked up are like the full-blown career criminals. Yeah. That's who, so you're in there with what we call the boys. Yeah. You know what I mean? In jail, you with like the licorice all sorts. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? The majority I, of people are just like weird, smelly people who like... There, the, there's nothing... Bash their mum and stuff. No, like, nothing glamorous. Not like at the all. boys' homes with the, the cool kids yes. that you're aspiring to be and you've all been caught and all put in there. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying with the jail, you see it for what it is. You're with the bottom of society. There, there's people that uh, have uh, stuffed up in life for all sorts of reasons yep. and uh, not necessarily cool gangsters. Nah. They, they can be, as nah. you said, someone that's beat if up their mum or, 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 or something as stupid as that. Mm. So... Did that make you reflect at all? Or were you still on that path going, ah, I'll, I'll that handle stage. this, this is a price I've got to pay? Definitely, I fought like that. No, I was not stopping. That was natural progression. Just made myself be one of the cooler boys in there. Copped it as it was. Yeah. yeah. How, um, who did you, like with the jails yep. back in those times, or uh, still still now, but there's isolation and, and way that uh, they keep uh, different groups. What groups were in the prisons when uh, you went in? Uh, so back then, there was... No prison gangs. Yep. Um, there were bikey gangs yeah. in prison. They were nothing. Yep. They were absolutely nobody in there. No power. No, they weren't running anything. It was extremely violent. The end of racial wars. Everything right. was about your race back then. Yeah. Now everything's about your gang or your bikey gang. Everything then was race. And um, there are four... Uh, like majorities in there. Yeah. Um, there's the Aboriginals, there's the Muslims, the Islanders, and the Asians. And yeah. you were on one, 
And it was, like I said, it was at the end of uh, wars in the late 90s into the early 2000s uh, that seen people getting killed. Like these were no like punch on things. Like plenty of pe like, people were getting stabbed and killed. And um, so like if you chose one and you were not to associate at all with the other. Yeah. Yeah, pe people like if there was enough phones in the yard, there'd be a phone for a race. Right. It's and, keep it separate. Yeah. And, and who do you identify with? So... And, and the breakup of it. Talk us through yeah. that because I think people would find that interesting. So because being from where I'm from, I'm from an Aboriginal area. Yep. All my best friends are Aboriginal. Yep. All my co-offenders have always been Aboriginal. All my girlfriends up until that point are Aboriginal. My son's Aboriginal. I was essentially like an Aboriginal in, in my yeah. mannerisms and everything. They, you they know? accepted you. Yeah, and... Yeah. And if you're going to go to jail with your co-offenders, yeah. four of them, and th and f they're all sitting with the Aboriginals, and I'm from Aboriginal areas, so it's natural. There yeah. was no other choice. Yeah. Um, it's the only people that I uh, like clicked with and that I felt family with, so I was immediately with them. Yeah. 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 And what were the what were the different vibes from the different groups? Like, yeah, you know, the Asians. What were they doing, or the the Islanders? Or... Oh wow. Um, just complete separation. So, at that time. That the, the Islanders and the Asians were together. Yeah. Right. They always the 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 smaller groups of uh, races in jail, and the the groups with the least power were the Islanders yeah. and the Asians. By far, in any jail system that or any jail that I went to, it was either ran by Lebos or Aboriginals. And yeah. That's a fact. As many as 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 you know, like I heard, it's a bit different now. There's like Islander gangs and stuff like that, and they got some power. I never ever in over the course of 17 years jail career yeah. never ever seen a jail that was ran by an islanders or asians it didn't exist so back then the the Kuris and the aboriginals used to be together yeah and the islanders and asians were together so yeah. you can imagine the power outnumbered there but the, the aboriginals and the um muslims had fights over certain things and broke up so it was like three groups sort of compl muslims completely to themselves um, very separated, uh, more so than any other of, of the races. Yeah. Aboriginals, um, same too. You can Im imagine a lot of historical things they've gone through and you can imagine where the, the old uncles who were in there, you're talking about like you're in a yard and I'm with the Aboriginals and I'm being like sort of like guided by 45-year-old Aboriginal men from Gilgandra and Will Kenya, yeah. who, and you can imagine what they've seen in their life. Yeah. So yeah. you can imagine their outlook on other people. Yeah. You know what I mean? And 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 you can sort of understand why. Um, so you can imagine like the groups of people. It's just like absolutely no mixing. You could get bashed for talking to using the wrong phone. It's like right. So yeah. it wasn't. It wasn't. You you couldn't go. Oh, but I know this bloke and. Uh, no. Look, maybe if you but, is your mate from the outside, yeah. you can have like a conversation away from the group. Yeah, yeah, but just to that extent. Did it uh, it change you at all? Uh, like the jail? What was your first stint in the adult prison? How long were you in there for? My first time I went to adult prison was for ninety percent sure it was a six month control order for uh, I. I I think I snatched the wallet out of a bloke's hand at the back of the casino. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, thinking that he won heaps, Asian bloke came out thinking he was he had a smile on his face. I was waiting there. I thought this bloke's rich as he's got a big win. Snatched it. It was like three hundred bucks in there. I got caught. But you, anyway, you, you're really like the way you talk there. Yeah. You're like a predator. Yeah, it yeah, is, I, isn't I, it? It's 100%. Like you, you're looking for a, a weak prey, and that's some bloke that's. Um, yeah, got a smile on his face and probably not concentrating. Though. I definitely yeah. like, of course, any thief is essentially a predator in some yeah. type of way. You're you're taking advantage of weaknesses and flaws in society for your own gain. Yeah. There's no yeah. other way about it. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, okay, so you did six months. Did you come out and go? Mm, is this the life I want? Or no, no, I didn't. Um, back to normal. Yeah. Um, straight into it. Like, it's weird, you know, like. Back then, I was still a heroin addict. Yeah, like let's and, never yeah, lose sight of that. Like the, the heroin is powerful. Talk, talk us, yeah. talk us through that because uh, people wouldn't understand the the draw or the power it's got. You need you well, need your hit, and you're well, going to basically whatever do logic anything. you have on behaviors, and it's just like 
just put it to the side. Yeah. Like I'm a heroin addict. Like yeah. it don't matter. It controls you. Yeah. Um, it's everything. It's yeah. it's it's everything. Like um what do you, what exactly you basically sell your soul to get a hit when you yeah there are people if if you're not skilled in the in the ways of making money there are people who would do putrid acts yeah then yeah, and, and happens to, to this people that will take everything their family has there's people that sell their bodies yeah and and like there so yeah. but luckily i was skilled in the art of making money and um it does involve preying on people's yeah you know. So you'd make money to feed the habit. Is that the, basically what you... You weren't making money because I want to buy Not a place or I want to nah, make money? Nah, nah, nah. Every bit. single cent I made was on heroin. Yeah. There'd be enough money to catch taxis around. If, if I made 1800 that day, yeah. I was spending 1600 on heroin. Yeah. If I made 700 bucks, I was spending 600 on heroin. I'll save enough for taxis and enough for a meat pie or something and that's it. Yeah, like you're a smart man when yep. you, you're um, caught up in that, uh, that sort of addiction. Do you think and go, what the fuck am I doing? Like, how do I get out of this? Or do you, did you ever have those feelings? Or? Not at the time, no. Yeah. Not at the, not at that time because it was still the way I seen my life and I was happy with it. I didn't see the other side of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, look, I, I think now is probably a good time to uh, take a break, uh, the end of uh, part one. Mm -hmm. uh, when we'll come back, we'll talk uh, more jail talk yep. and uh, interestingly how you've turned your, your life around. But I think anyone that's listening, you, you listen to this podcast, you have an interest in crime, or well, we're getting that this is the world of crime. Yep. This is, uh, and I appreciate your honesty yeah, because yeah. It, uh, and your frankness because it, it sort of uh, really opens up to the way people are thinking when they are committing these crimes. So um, let's have a break and we'll be back soon. Sweet. Cheers.